Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this event today. Uh, I just saw it on the title slide, but I'll say it again. This is how does climate crisis change? How does the climate crisis change the curriculum, innovating in education, and the future of work? Um, this is an event which has been organized by the Climate Crisis Thinking in the Humanities and Social Sciences Network, which is part of the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities. And um, this event is also part of a series of events, of podcasts, of panel discussions that are part of the UK University's COP26 Network's Innovation Showcase. So today with COP26 kicking off, it's a great time to be uh, part of this group. My name is Bill Finnegan. I am a doctoral student at the School of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford. And uh, my research is looking at climate change education and also school sustainability for secondary schools in the UK. Uh, and I'm really here just to kind of moderate this panel. Uh, we've got a great group of people and um, the format is, is basically we're going to start with some introductions, kind of brief introductions from each of the panelists. And um, then we have a series of questions. We're really approaching this very informally, um, a kind of direct questions to particular members of the panel, but then anyone who has anything to add can, can jump in at any time. And um, for anyone joining us for the webinar, um, there's a Q&A function. So put any questions you have for the panel there. We'll be keep, keeping track of that. And then towards the end of the panel, we'll, we'll try and bring in as many of the audience questions as we can. Um, so for the introductions, I think I should be easiest if I just go down the list as it appears for me in Zoom. So I think we'll probably go through kind of first name alphabetical, if that's okay. So Amanda, do you mind starting just with an introduction again, uh, who you are, where you're coming from, and a bit of context, like how it relates to the topic of, of today's session. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Power. I'm an Associate Professor of Medieval History in Oxford. Um, I'm also the co-convener of the, the Climate Crisis Thinking in the Humanities and Social Sciences Network. Um, so my research has increasingly been about how um, having a historical background to, to thinking about how we got into the situation that we're in and why we're having trouble dealing with it. Um, my research is sort of partly about disinterring that and, and making it speak usefully, um, both in educational and, and other contexts. Um, I think that's perhaps enough from me for now. Um, Aryan, do you mind introducing yourself as well? Sure, uh, Arjen Wals. I'm, I'm located in the Netherlands at the moment at Wageningen University, Life Science University. Um, and I'm also a UNESCO Chair in Social Learning for Sustainable Development. Uh, my background is in environmental and sustainability education. Um, and um, one of the key themes at the moment that we are working with is what we call the whole school or whole institution approach to sustainability. So we're looking for more integrated uh, approaches to anchoring sustainability meaningfully in curriculum in in the school as a as a as a as an operation but also in school community relationships and finding new ways of teaching and learning that are more relational that are more holistic uh, that can also tackle uh, problems like climate change uh, in a more systemic way looking at the root causes um, also looking at new kinds of competencies and qualities that we need to do this in a good way Great, thank you. Um, James, will you introduce yourself? Hi everybody, I'm James Robson. I'm Deputy Director of SCOPE, that's the Centre for Skills, Knowledge and Organisational Performance at the Department of Education at Oxford. Uh, I'm also a lecturer in higher education. My work focuses on structures, policies and political economies of higher and tertiary education systems, uh, with a particular focus on the intersection between education, employment and sustainability along with skills, supply and demand, research ecosystems and social justice. Um, I, I'm really excited to be part of this discussion today. Um, I think the curriculum and education and training systems more broadly should sit at the heart of any conversation about sustainability and the climate crisis. And you know, some of my work focuses on this in terms of skills, supply and demand, in terms of looking at what we mean by green jobs and green skills and how education and training systems can supply the skills that uh, are required by a changing future, but also how we can envision new futures and new ways of working uh, to actually drive change at a systemic level. Great, thanks. Kim? 
Hello, um, I'm Kim Polgreen. I'm a freelance sustainability educator based here in Oxford. Um, my background is in science. I was a biochemist once upon a time. Um, in business, where I used to work on sustainability consultancy work for businesses, and in education, where I've, I've run an education business uh, primarily focused on the International Baccalaureate Diploma Programme. Um, so now, currently, my two main roles are that I run a teen summer school on sustainability at the Environmental Change Institute at the University here in Oxford. Um, and I'll tell to talk a little bit about that uh, later. And I'm also the youth educator in residence at White and Woods, which is the university's research woodlands. And I'm responsible for sort of bringing groups of students into the woods and talking to them about biodiversity, climate, and just um, enjoying being out there. Um, and I'm also working with local schools and teachers here in Oxford on a range of sustainability projects. Um, currently, we're doing one on sustainable fashion. I'm going to do a fashion shoot at the Natural History Museum next week. Um, and one on planting for pollinators and, and all sorts of different things. So there's lots going on in the, in the teacher and school um, environment here. Thanks. Great. Um, Rahul, can you introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Rahul Chopra. I currently lead and uh, coordinate a global climate change education project of the International Union of Biological Sciences. This project, which is called TROP ICSU, which stands for Transdisciplinary Research Oriented Pedagogy for Improving Climate Studies and Understanding, is a project which uh, seeks to kind of integrate climate change education into the curriculum of many, many different subjects. Uh, in addition to sort of, you know, uh, you know doing some work with, with uh, teachers across the world, uh, I also have, am the convener of what is called the National Resource Center on Climate Change at ISER Pune, which is a university in India. Uh, our job there was uh, to essentially create a MOOC for teacher training. And we titled this Climate Change a Guide for Teachers of All Disciplines. And even though it is not really part of the curriculum as a separate standalone subject, uh, we got several thousand people who registered for this course. So I think these are the two main hats related to, you know, today's discussion that, that I currently wear. Uh, in addition to this, I had uh, founded an environmental studies undergraduate program at a liberal arts college in Pune. It was the first of its kind in India. It's called Flame University. <clears throat> Uh, my background and training in the beginning was from the University of Chicago, but it was in geophysical sciences, but I was exposed to climate change understanding and the science from the big guys there. Uh, very, very excited to be here and learn and talk to everybody on this particular panel. Thank you for having me. Great, thanks. And, um, and then to complete the panel, um, Stephen, can you introduce yourself as well? Thanks very much. And yeah, thanks also for having me. I'm really excited to be here and we have this um, really important discussion with these great people. Um, my background is a secondary school geography teacher um, and I now work as a geography teacher educator. So training people to become secondary school geography teachers. Um, I'm primarily interested in questions about um, subject knowledge and about teachers' subject knowledge and particularly where they go to to get the information that they're then using to teach. Um, I see that research being located at the interface between the academic discipline and school subject um, of geography, but also of this relationship between disciplines and school subjects in general. So I've seen questions about how knowledge is transformed and how these massive disciplines are made accessible um, to much younger people. Um, one of the recent projects that we've been involved with, um, with colleagues, including um, Rahul and James and others um, on climate change education features in India, um, has asked this question about information for teaching about climate change education of educators in India across a range of scales from um, kind of primary context right through to postgraduate context and across um, many different states. It's then kind of raised some really interesting questions and has um, really been useful for understanding the ways in which um, some of those kind of comparative aspects of this um, and some of the big ways in which particular kind of knowledge production centres um, are dominating in this whole debate. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. Great. Um, so. 
in this conversation, we were really going to start with that kind of that central question, which was kind of in the name of the event, which is how does the climate crisis change the way we teach, change education? So, um, you know, we're going to start with Amanda, but I think we'll also bring in Steve on that. And again, it's thinking about how each subject is conceptualized, taught, related to other subject areas. Um, so, Amanda, do you mind, as you convened us especially, do you mind um, starting us off on that question? Surely. Um, so I think I thought I might start off at a, at a, a sort of stepping back, um, sort of far away from the curriculum to think about how we conceptualise our disciplines um, and then come a little bit closer to it. Um, so I, I just a few general remarks to start with. I mean, it, I think it's very striking that if education had begun from, say, the early 1990s to reflect deepening scientific understanding around climate change, more than half the current working and voting population would have been equipped at school to understand what's happening and to make informed choices in all areas of their life, including politically. And that would have been building incrementally generation after generation um, since that, well over the last 30, 40 years. Since this wasn't done in most countries and in most disciplines, we're increasingly finding ourselves in, in the shocking position that the, the mainstream teaching curricula for most subjects barely acknowledges or addresses planetary realities. And I'm aware that this is a, a starker feeling for someone working in the humanities where it really doesn't. And there are subjects that, that do address it um, much better. And there are ways in which individual teachers and individual schools have, have tried to introduce programs that do do this. Um, but I think on the level of um, educational policy, there's still a, 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 a great rupture between the world that the scientists and, and and many other researchers describe and and the sort of a future that people are being educated to to enter into and i suppose that was that reflection that was partly um producing this panel um so i think it's it's probably not putting it too strongly to say that that we are still educating generations to live in what's an increasingly threadbare fantasy of growth stability and opportunity um and that like most of the adult population today students coming out of schools are still lacking the emotional, conceptual and ethical equipment to deal with, with this real world. Um, and I think in terms of how um, politicians uh, uh, particularly, but, but many others sort of see education as it is about competition to get the best results rather than collaboration, um, valuing educational outcomes by monetary earnings predominantly and teaching students I mean this is perhaps particularly a problem in my field to be proud of their country rather than to be critical and useful citizens of it and I think these these are, are probably sort of routes to disaster in terms of producing adaptable societies but I think also the the very bleak picture of student mental health is is very likely to be a product of all these factors um so I think if we're if we're wanting to think about how to reconceptualize I've, I've drawn this darkly I, I appreciate um, but but in order to um, start thinking about how we would reconceptualize beyond adapting the current curriculum, like how, how if we were starting a, a new set of school curriculum from scratch, what how would we want to build it? Um, I think recognizing the roots of the existing disciplines and what they've they've sort of grown up to teach is quite important. So I mean I think it's it's a fact that most modern academic disciplines, um, as well as our ways of thinking about teaching and, and producing knowledge, are actually very old. Um, and they were formulated within a conceptual and a governing framework that invested humans with, uh, with um, a sense of domination and agency over environments um, and was very interested in de developing that human domination um, over environments and other humans. And I think built into that was a sense that truths were produced by human investigations. Um, and that was something that particular types of humans were uniquely equipped to do, whereas others were um, objects of that knowledge production and as education broadened in the population, there's still a sense that it's a top-down business of teaching um, groups of people who need to learn knowledge that have been produced by others rather than making a more participatory type of education. Um, and I mean, historically speaking, people who are closer to environments, whether they're barbarians or peasants or rustics or indigenous populations were always seen as people to be taught things rather than people whose knowledge would be valuable. And so a lot of this is, is, is flipping the assumption that the closer you are to, to natural environments, the less you actually know that's important for our societies. Um, so I think a lot of the sort of core paradigms um, need rethinking and, and the more we can involve students in those sorts of rethinking, I think the more exciting and more engaging they're going to find their education. Um, so if we stop thinking that, that development and modernization um, 
for the sake of it are the most important things for a society to be doing. And we start thinking about sustainable practices involving students in, in those questions and those knowledge production, um, you know, the, 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 those, um, those kind of radical transformations to how we even produce knowledge, I think, um, uh, would represent an important paradigm shift. Um, a bit more in, in slightly more concrete terms, um, I think for the humanities, it's going to be very important to restore the environmental context to all, all the disciplines. So at the moment, we do have a, a very significant rupture between the world as we think it is or we used to think it was and a very unsettling future um, and, a, and a sort of disturbing and unsettling present. Um, how can we bring those things back together so that we can understand the present situation as very, very deeply rooted in human history and human values, um, human storytelling, um, the, the ways that, that humans are sort of put together their sense of self. There isn't really a rupture between the very dominant modes of understanding ourselves and, and the very long history through which these things grew. Um, so I think um, to, to do that, one needs to develop new forms of interdisciplinarity. So bringing sciences and geographies and humanities together um, to learn how we look at these planetary past climate shifts, volcanic activities, anthropogenic impacts on micro-regional ecologies, looking at pathogens and bacteria, disease and its impacts. All these things can move easily between sciences and, and humanities fields to, to give us a much richer understanding of, of how the planet works. Um, teaching students to think on different scales from the ones they're used to, I think is really crucial. Um, and I think humanities can just two final points before I hand over to, to Steve. I think in, in humanities, um, thinking about how human societies have experienced and responded to both very catastrophic environmental changes and smaller scale ones that are a bit difficult to pick up in the time, but incrementally have a big effect. So the Little Ice Age is a sort of classic example of, of a sort of shift in environmental conditions that did require different forms of resilience and provided societies with different opportunities. Um, and I think the final thing that I'd want to say is that humanities subjects, um, when they're radically reconceived, I think can offer this sort of emotional and ethical teaching that, that is going to be really crucial, I think, for future generations. So there isn't much that hasn't happened yet um, in history that um, can happen to individuals so that the ways in which we'll experience loss and destabilization and the ways in which we might be able to gather ourselves to work together um, to, to live sustainably, to have hope, um, to, to see things in terms of collective benefit rather than individual competition. All, all that material's there. It's in there in historical experience. It's in literature. It's in music. It's in poetry. It's all there to be accessed and, and, and mobilized as a kind of living cultural tradition. Um, and I'm, I'm not meaning just in the West. I mean, it, all, all countries, all peoples have their ways of talking. If these were sort of brought back as, um, as kind of living ways of thinking and inhabiting the world rather than something that you study and get examined on. I think all these would be very important transformative um, ways to approach education. Steve. Yeah, well, thanks very much. <laughs> you also have to start just so many different areas um, to pick up on. And there, when Bill was kind of framing that question, there were a couple of different ways in which I was kind of keen to think through particularly starting with geography and then working out in what ways does this one subject then relate to other subjects and and how does climate change do something different to that relationship and I guess the way in which you've kind of framed that about these past things having happened and, and there's nothing new that's going to happen that hasn't already that kind of fundamental question is the climate crisis something that is then fundamentally new to education and transforming to education in a way that actually kind of other things haven't been um, or are there big continuities with other kind of debates and other challenges and other problems that education's kind of needed to um, impact and needed to address and I, I guess for me the way in which um, the subjects are addressing this question is a really helpful kind of point to to kind of go into that conversation and so the way in which you might think of subjects being these kind of big centers of knowledge production that have generated some really kind of like incredible insights into um, various different things that we experience and engage with and so on but have got 
also this really problematic past that looking in a particular context of geography and doing that from um, kind of an Oxford context, there's been so many debates recently about the ways in which these massive figures in Oxford geography, people like Half Mackinder, that had particular really racialized and racist views of the world and of geographies to produce these imperial systems, it means that we've got, I mean, what Arathi Sripakash and colleagues have called the kind of um, drawing on Mignola's work, the, the shadow and shine of disciplinary knowledge and of the kind of knowledge that you might teach in school and because of the ways in which these debates about climate change are then tied up in these big disciplinary systems then actually those kind of racialized ways in which that knowledge has been framed and also those just massive stories that have been told about countries and about development and about economics and about progress and all of the different ways in which we've kind of envisioned and conceptualized the ways in which countries might interact. And I mean, you mentioned Amanda a few times, this notion of kind of competition and particularly in terms of education, kind of completely buying into that um, and completely taking on that narrative about um, really just kind of other forms of exceptionalism that you want education to then produce people who are able to kind of compete and to win and so on. Um, and so for me, the big ways in which this disciplinary knowledge is, is tied up in all of these different conversations and means that kind of some of the work of untangling that and some of the work of kind of speaking back to those um, disciplines and those subjects um, means that there's just this brilliant opportunity through climate change education to do some of that work. And I mean, you mentioned this notion of kind of critical um, citizens and, and critical people who are able to then um, ask these kind of really hard questions. Um, and I think some of those big themes that you brought up would be really useful ways in which and we might think of subjects kind of interacting. So these big questions about scale and about time and about certainty and uncertainty. And a couple of um, really interesting things that have kind of come up through the recent work that we've been doing with um, teachers in India. So one particular question um, kind of on a temporal layer. So we've got this massive thing, climate change, that we might understand over kind of vast geologic time, but then is also experienced in these kind of the immediacy. And this one kind of way in which teacher was describing the real challenge of engaging students um, I think that's a really kind of polarised thing that some students kind of incredibly um, motivated and are really kind of um, advocating for big change in curriculum, um, whereas others, like with any subject, kind of not and completely disengaged. Um, and this teacher then kind of coming to this point where they say, um, I can't get them to think about it until the AC breaks. The air conditioning breaks and then bang, it's too hot. And suddenly it's this kind of embodied experience thing that then is kind of, ah, this is an issue. And I think you've seen that a bit in the ways in which various different um, wildfires and others have been reported over the last kind of year or so. You've had these kind of moments where there's been these extreme weather events that then has kind of forced the conversation and has meant that kind of um, some stronger kind of denialist forms have been much harder. But then for the teachers, then got this really tricky dilemma. How do we deal with describing something that is big changes over time and relating that to these immediate embodied things? And that question, I mean, there's obviously been lots of work done in kind of um, climate science and looking at kind of the science around weather attribution and the really kind of quite complex ways in which um, there's kind of probabilities that are down being kind of thrown to say, oh, this event was kind of like three times more likely, a hundred times more likely and so on. But quite how a teacher might kind of engage with that big question about kind of scale and time. Um, I think there's some really fascinating ways in which history and geography and others um, kind of have got to speak to those debates. Um, and the other thing that um, I was going to also pick up on a kind of a question from the Q&A and kind of relate that to parts um, of this in terms of this um, knowledge production centres. So Nikita's question, and can we say a bit more, can I say a bit more about what I meant by some knowledge production centres dominating the debate? Um, and just to give an, another quick example from that work that we've been doing um, with colleagues in India, we did a uh, just one kind of little simple illustration of this. We did a Google search um, at the same time, but in two different places. So I did the search in Oxford and then colleagues in Pune did the same search. So we we're on Google and we searched for climate change teaching resources. And, and both did this search at the same time. So we've got our own computers with their own kind of histories and our own kind of logins and all the rest of it. Um, but in those two, obviously kind of geographically separated places, 
we then compared the top 10 results from those searches um, and the similarity was absolutely staggering. And so neither of us had any resources that were produced um, in India or in websites that were based in India, even though one of those searches is done in India. Um, we both had a single primary school in Doncaster and they had a little page on climate change education, uh, but obviously done some good kind of SEO stuff. And so both had that page and then had various other um, things. There were some kind of Irish resources and various other resources, particularly um, kind of from an English context. Um, and when Google is such a powerful filter through which teachers are accessing information about climate change um, and that kind of digital mediation of all of this stuff um, being the ways in which information is, is accessed and then is also kind of made visible, and um, that seems to be a really striking example of the way in which finding local resources or finding information that's representing this big global challenge, um, but in a specific context, has actually been shaped in particular ways and has been kind of framed through particular lenses that either gives um, examples from particular places or is just tied up in the broader um, kind of discourses, so these metaphors and narratives and so on, um, of those particular places. Um, and so I think that's another big challenge challenge at curriculum level and for teachers is how does these questions about scale and place work out? How do we kind of get the information resources and so on um, that allow us to look in our particular context um, and then to do this really challenging intellectual work of relating those things to then this bigger, broader global scale? Um, great. Kim, I think you might wanted to come in uh, on this question as well. Um, did you have something to add? Um, I could come in later, Bill, in whatever order you want. Okay, I guess it's a question of, of if anybody who wants to jump in on this kind of initial question and how it's been set up by, by Amanda and Stephen. Um, James, did you want to hop in now? I, I just wanted to add a, a quick point in, in relation to, uh, to Steve's um, final points about the mediation of knowledge, which I think is really important. Um, I'd just like to um, say I, I thought that as, as starting off, um, yeah, statements, um, Amanda and Steve, that, those were excellent, <laughs> really enjoyable to listen to. Um, but this point about knowledge is, is, is really important when teachers are engaging with knowledge and accessing knowledge that's mediated by the internet, it really shapes the way in which knowledge is constructed. The internet is not a neutral space. Google is not neutral as, as, um, as, as Steve has highlighted, but Google is just one place in which teachers access knowledge. Um, uh, a lot of teachers in, in research I've done use social media to access knowledge, and there's, you know, one of the one of the worst places for a lack of neutrality. Um, it's it's knowledge that's algorithmically shaped. And social media is um, embedded or, or is permeated with a whole range of political and economic and commercial agendas, which fundamentally shape the kinds of knowledge that exists on there and the ways in which teachers interact with it and so that kind of process of mediation interaction and engagement is is so important that we need we really need to understand this in more depth I think to explore the ways in which teachers are constructed through their um, interactions with perhaps non-neutral knowledge and the way in which different commercial and political agendas shape teachers' perceptions of climate change, uh, and then how that gets reframed within the classroom. So I think it's such an important point that, that we need to, uh, need to keep coming back to, really. Great. Um, thank you for that. Um, I was actually going to um, shift this out over to Aryan. You know, Aryan, when we first got in touch about this panel, you kind of flipped the this question on its head and kind of said, you know, we refra reframed it. How does the curriculum change the climate crisis? And so I, I think um, coming from that direction, there might be different ways to interpret it, but it, you could be talking about how, how the way we are taught now has got us to where we are, but mm. also how that curriculum shapes the possibilities of the future and, and potentially kind of a, maybe a, a kind of a, a just transition or, or whatever you might see as, as the best way forward. So could you comment on that yeah, too? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, for one, you could say that um, education, um, um, we should kind of interrogate uh, the goodness of education in a way. Not all education is good. And uh, it's not like the more we have of it, the better. 
I think we need to really think about what is education strengthening in society and what is it silencing or weakening in society. And I think there is a hidden curriculum of unsustainability in our schools and universities where we cultivate certain mindsets or certain values uh, uh, that, that, that really work against uh, sustainability. Uh, and just as an example, uh, the, the mindset of, of, of expansion and growth, um, individualism, uh, taking care of yourself, um, is, is very, you know, uh, emphasizing personal growth all the time that you always must develop, otherwise you fall behind. That is very much uh, 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 promoted, advocated, uh, embedded in our schools and universities. Um, so our curriculum, you might say, which also is indeed siloing much knowledge and, and, and uh, the dissecting the world in, in categories, boxes, disciplines, where we're very good at making distinctions, drawing boundaries, but we're terrible at seeing connections, seeing relations, interdependencies. So there is this uh, curriculum of unsustainability that's quite strong. And as David Orr, you probably, you know, David Orr, Bill, from Oberlin College has, has said in the past, you know, if we don't think about this critically, we are basically education is, is creating more effective vandals of the earth. And the people who are the most have the biggest ecological footprints are not those with, with you know, they are not those growing up in the slums of Mumbai. They're people with master's degrees, bachelor degrees and, 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 and PhDs. Uh, so I think this is something to think about. So the question then is, um, how can we redesign, reorient uh, education in such a way that we become more relational, uh, that we can decenter the human at times, that we can also think about uh, sustainable contraction in addition to sustainable growth, that we also learn to live within boundaries and limits, that we also learn things like empathy and compassion where we can change perspectives, where we also had learned to accept that uh, there's no such thing as neutral knowledge. You know, we need to actually politicize and we need to pluralize agendas and we need to understand where does knowledge come from, who generated it, with what kinds of questions underneath um, um, and, and learn to interrogate that. And that has to do with critical thinking, of course. Um, and something else that I think is missing and, and that we need to uh, pay more attention to is the moral compass. Uh, we can develop all kinds of qualities like uh, creativity, dealing with conflict, uh, pluralizing, uh, uh, dealing with ambiguity and chaos and complexity and uncertainty. Um, but we can use that to, to, you know, to expand uh, a market share of a company that we might work uh, to, for or to increase shareholder value. Or in other words, the moral compass of, that we have that kind of tells us what's good, what's important, what matters, uh, uh, which has to do with ethics and values is often ignored in our schools and universities. So we also need to uh, bring in uh, pay more attention to ethics and values in addition to all, all the other sustainability qualities, competencies like uh, systems thinking, uh, which you often hear, anticipatory thinking, dealing with uncertainty, social emotional learning, which has been ignored in schools and universities. How do we deal with anxiety, stress? Um, we kind of walk away from that in our schools and you know, we cannot blame our schools either. It is often teachers, school leaders who do not get any space for more relational ways of teaching and learning, for going outside the classroom, for using the local environment as a living laboratory for, for learning about existential questions, how, how we are affected by climate change, how we, how biodiversity in our local communities is disappearing, how our everyday problems are nested in the wider global world, how what we do affects people far away elsewhere, but also in the future, but also what happens elsewhere in the world, how that affects us. Um, there's no space for that, often because we have national curricula, we have a, a, a very much a, 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 a curriculum focusing on measurement, testing, excellence, um, and that is kind of killing learning in our schools, ironically. So there's something that needs to be happening. And in some countries, like in, like in, I work a lot in Norway and in Sweden, but also when you look at Finland and a little bit, hopefully in the Netherlands, 
there's some cur curriculum reform reforms taking place that create more space for more localized curricula, a little bit off the Google grid, where we need to actually go outside, find knowledge and information, investigate ourselves through forms of citizen science, where we become independent from Google, just like the energy transition is trying to get localized self uh, interdependent independent uh, forms of energy creation, food creation. We also need to think about knowledge creation in that way. Now, these are just some thoughts I want to throw uh, throw at you, Bill, and the audience uh, to consider. Great. Um, I, I, lots of ideas already on the table now. And I feel like, I guess one thing I just want to come back to is, I've been a part of other panels or watched other panels where people have talked about climate change education. And it's been very much within the system as it is now, as in you're talking about, you know, do you talk about climate science or climate mitigation or climate adaptation in a science class? Um, and, you know, maybe if you're looking across disciplines, it's kind of a special project, but it's still very narrowly defined with how schools work now. And it seems like with both of these questions, we're talking about schools working differently, education being a different um, experience. And so I don't know if there's anything else I worry that we can also get very abstract when we talk about these things. And so I don't know if there's anything else that we can hook this onto that feels more concrete about what that looks like, what that feels like as a learner or as a teacher. Um, anyone have any, any thoughts about that? Um, I saw both Kim and Raul. Um, Kim, I saw you first. You got, you, you um, jumped in. <laughs> I was just going to um, do a shout out really for extracurricular education, which I think is is really growing around these areas around um, you know wildlife and biodiversity, uh, the movement was the new GCSE in natural history in the UK, um, massive growth in forest schools and things. I think there's kind of a demand developing from students and their parents for for new types of education, taking kids out of the classroom in the in the way that's been described. You know, and, and I'm one of those, you know, I'm running summer schools, I'm running weekend events, um, I'm enticing schools through sort of well-being and field work and things out, out into the woods um, and giving them extra bits of knowledge about climate change and biodiversity while they're there doing their transect measurements. Um, I kind of see this as a bit of a test bed for, for new approaches and hopefully a bit of a Trojan horse that, you know, if we can show how well these types of, of extracurricular education work, maybe that's a stimulus. Uh, first for schools and the national curriculum to sort of bring some of these approaches and yeah getting out of the classroom um, into the mainstream school system. Um, great and Raul can you come in on this one as well? Yeah so I think thanks Bill uh, this kind of fits in with the work I've been doing last couple of years which is on our project uh, <clears throat> which really you know is about getting you know, the down to like, how do we actually implement this, right? And I think that's the important sort of question because the ideas, everybody knows this is the most critical issue of our time, but what do we do in order to get a potential solution, right? And if we say that solutions will be a combination of, let's say, geoengineering, policy level change, but also recognition that the impacts of climate change and solutions would come from local places by local people who experience the local sort of situation there. And a combination of all of these three might lead to that. Right? So if we start to move from that assumption that education can be situated towards trying to find a solution, let's say, and that sort of speaks to what Amanda said initially and Aryan too about saying, you know, what is the purpose of education overall? Right. And if we start to look at these from issues and the SDGs become a good enough place to get started with, no poverty, who doesn't want that? You know, climate change or, you know, biodiversity and protection of species, et cetera, et cetera. So we looked at climate change, right? And the idea is, what do we do? How do you go about getting people to be aware of climate change, right? So let me just start off and say, I've through the project, we've done a survey of curriculum across the world, and it is underrepresented almost in every country. It doesn't matter if it's a developed country or it's a developing country. The US seems to do a lot more compared to most countries because they seem to have a lot more freedom and flexibility in the private universities there. But it is underrepresented, certainly at the school level. It is fairly, you know, cosmetic. 
at the college level, which is undergraduate, and this is where we focused a lot of our material on, you know, where would it be offered, right? And so if it would be offered, it would be offered in an earth sciences program. It would be offered maybe in a geography program, maybe in an environmental sciences program. Now that course, if you start to look and see how many students are actually enrolling in those programs, that would be a very small sort of number of, you know, when you, when you look at who all are enrolling in colleges, right? Psychology is very important, uh, popular, economics is very popular, sociology is very popular, and so on and so forth. So, so our goal was to say that, you know, curriculum uh, reform takes time. If you want climate change to be introduced to everyone who comes into college, and I get it that, you know, I'm dealing with a constituency who can afford to go to college. So let's keep that aside and the formal education system. So let's just keep that aside for a second. We realize that. But, you know, uh, the proportion of people who would get this information in an earth sciences or geography program would be very, very small, right? Instead, if you want to take it to everyone, how do we go about doing this? So we started looking and seeing ways in which we could develop lesson plans that teachers of all disciplines could use in their teaching. What would they use? They would teach a topic in their discipline, but we would provide them with a climate change case study exercise or hands-on activity. We focus as much as possible on local resources, Aryan, that might help to sort of understand that the learning is best done in your own local situation. So let's give local examples, local case studies, maybe even a story. And Amanda, that is incredibly powerful when you put, just put in a you know, local story about an impact which is taking place to somebody, you know, and that person relates to it from that location. You start with that. And then you put in a hands-on activity, but you're doing it while you're teaching a topic in the discipline, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to basically integrate it into the teaching, the day-to-day -day teaching across disciplines. Now, why are we trying to do this? Well, number one, Amanda, I think you mentioned, who's trained to teach climate change at this point? We didn't have it. Well, you know, most of us would not have had it in our undergraduate training, let's say, number one, right? So where are we trained to do it? Number two, teachers are incredibly stressed for time, right? Three, they are given these syllabi by, you know, boards and uh, you know, higher up authorities and they have to stick to that. So their primary job is not to like, you know, spark interest or to make somebody aware, et cetera, et cetera. It is like, I got to finish my, what is given to me. That's my job, right? So how do we do this? So, you know, we sit down and we say, okay, if you are a teacher in the humanities uh, and you are doing a senior level class on post-colonial studies, here's an essay by Deepesh Chattro. They read that and you know, try to link it to climate change. If you're a teacher in economics, here's tragedy of the commons, use it to understand you know, things related to emissions or so. If you're a math teacher, you have to teach you know, calculus, here's carbon dioxide data, and this is a hands-on activity to you know, go ahead to learn that, right? So you know, this way we've kind of gone across disciplines, we have 10 of them. And we managed to sort of put together a fair number of resources to actually implement this, right? And I think this is sort of one, uh, you know, effort on, on our part. It's small and it's proof of concept still. We have close to 600 resources there right now, uh, which potentially could be a way in which, you know, we get people aware of climate change to begin with. And just finish up by saying that, imagine a kid who has gone through a class of you know, briefly understanding what is the science of climate change, then going to an economics class and learning about cost benefit analysis and microeconomics through climate change, and then going to a biology class and learning about biodiversity using a climate related example, then goes to a math class and learns calculus and understands CO2 emissions are responsible, then goes to a, you know, uh, psychology class and understands what is climate psychiatry and you know how is mental health getting affected by that goes into history and understands you know how civilizations might have declined due to climate change in the past that kid and you put it with examples related to their location potentially in their language which we're working on 
that kid would know more than me, right? And that kid would then potentially come up with a solution which would work for his or her location. So that's sort of been the driver, one part for me, and I don't know if this talks to anyone else, I'll stop after this, which is for me, the personal driver was, uh, you know, how do you democratize education while you're doing this? So the digital allows for that. So we have digital tools. Number two, you know, a fantastic lecture that Stephen might give in his classroom. If it is out on YouTube, I will collate and curate that and make it available to teachers across the world to also use it. We magnify this by getting experts from around the world who've created so much information already out there. We can get into whether that information is, you know, uh, you know, doctored for lack of another word through Google and other search engines, but it becomes one way in which you can get quality education and make it accessible to all. So that's just, you know, uh, our project, which kind of talks about the practical nature in which we are trying to implement this by not shifting the curriculum completely. It'll take time until that happens because that's a bureaucratic process. But while we can actually get teachers to do it in their day-to-day -day activities itself without stressing them or burdening them excessively so that they could actually you know, impart that knowledge, goes to the kids, they come up with solutions for the future. Let's stop there. Stephen, did you want to follow up on that? Yes, okay. And um, I was just going to kind of make a point, um, kind of like using some of those points that Rahul's um, made to kind of um, like speak back to one of the, the things that Kim was talking about. Um, and I guess I just wanted to kind of um, pick up on the, the use of extracurricular um, things um, for climate change work. Um, and I guess my point is probably slightly more um, like I think critical or cynical is the right way of putting it. Um, but about the um, the kind of the way in which um, kind of extracurricular work uh, currently has a kind of um, a role to play. So I think um, first kind of thing I'd say is that the the way in which um, that kind of splits along, so that that being engagement in extracurricular stuff, um, splits along kind of um, class and race um, type um, issues, um, means that yeah, the types of people who are currently engaging in that kind of work um, kind of represent one particular, um, normally kind of like very privileged. Um, kind of part of the population and the other I was really interested in the um, thing Kim you said about um, if we can kind of show that it works then that's maybe a kind of a way in and so there's kind of there's certainly kind of like greater interest and, and these things are like I mean I'm completely sold like absolutely brilliant things and really important um, but I think this kind of point about if we can show how well they work um, and it's related to the things other people have said about the importance of these big narratives about how we define a, a good education system and um, means that for something to be able to be shown to kind of work well in education at the minute and um, really the kind of the, the dominant paradigm is so reductionist around grades and we've seen recently the kind of link between particular subjects at degree level and earnings and um, the, the kind of the, the narrative that's told around what counts as kind of quality um, education that's working well um, is really impoverished and so I think that um, actually the kind of the the most urgent thing currently are these questions about teacher professional development and about the ways in which individual teachers who are already in front of and accessing and teaching vast numbers of young people worldwide um, mean, and the kinds of freedoms that they have got even in the kind of most rigid formal systems um, actually this work they're doing in terms of curating selecting particular forms of information and knowledge and um, the ways in which they're kind of critically or not engaging with the kind of presentation of particular narratives and so on um, and and in contrast to that the kind of complete lack of climate change education that they many of them had in their own formal education and um, means that that for me this kind of how do we equip teachers how do we 
kind of empower teachers? How do we do the kind of work um, that Rahul's talking about in terms of um, trying to make little subtle shifts? How can we make maths um, examples, not just about you spent this much money, how much change is there and how do we kind of make more money and what's the interest on this? But instead to ask about these bigger kind of questions about climate and so on. And so um, while like, I'm completely in favour of this extra work and I think it's um, fantastic, I think I'm probably like very um, uh, cynical about the, the, like, the real potential for that to kind of affect broader change. Um, and so you see this kind of like, how can we upskill teachers? How can we um, provide this kind of professional development? That being something that um, actually presents across multiple different curricula um, and across many different types of kind of exam certifications and so on. And some really kind of um, like subversive attempts maybe um, to reframe these debates and to ask some quite different questions. Um, I, since I know both Kim and Aryan want to come in on this one. Um, Kim, did you have a, a quick follow up? Yeah, just quickly, because I know you want to move on. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that the, in the experiences I've had with kids on summer schools and um, just coming up sort of for day trips and things, that the, the enthusiasm and the excitement when you start having these interdisciplinary conversations is incredible. They really love it. And, you know, we've had conversations which bring in finance and economics and politics. And we talk about, you know, the local politics, national politics, the science. How is science done? How, is, how do people know what the scientists are saying? You know, the, I think the kids are, are making these connections, but it can be done quite quickly and more overtly. if We're just giving them the forum to do so. Um, so I think that they are learning amazing things and with the, with the opportunities to make connections, they, they've really got them there. That's all I want to say. Um, and, and Arian, did you have a follow up as well? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it, it, I, I agree that uh, extracurricular activities uh, can, can provide an opening for engaging uh, uh, in these big existential questions like climate change. Um, at the same time, I, I do think that we, we need to um, kind of upscale the informal learning and bring it more into the classroom in a way. There are so many everyday activities, whether it's, you know, the, the things that we eat every day, uh, the way we walk to school or drive to school, depending on where you are, or bike to school. Um, the way we uh, deal with water in our communities, the way we deal with uh, extreme weather events. Um, um, so, so I, I think that should become more in, embedded in the curriculum rather than, than resorting to leaving schools and finding these spaces outside of our schools. I think it's a, it's a responsibility for, for our schools to, 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 uh, to open up uh, uh, these connections between the life world of the, of the students and, the, and the, the local environment and the existential issues that emerge there. And this can be done in very concrete ways. I mean, already some examples were mentioned of, of going outdoors and, and, and the monitor, you could do monitoring of, of, of biodiversity, which is done in communities or water quality of noise, le noise levels and um, uh, monitoring diets and, 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 and seeing how you can reduce uh, uh, meat protein intakes and in diets. Very important to also mind the gap between, you know, being aware and understanding these issues and actually doing something about them in our everyday lives and also pointing out the inconsistencies and sometimes the hypocrisy. Uh, we must avoid, uh, to use Greta Thunberg's uh, words, a blah, blah, blah curriculum. Uh, you know, where there's a lot of talk about this, but not a lot of action. And if we do not that, do that, then, we, then it will be, lead to maybe skepticism, cynicism, apathy, powerlessness, which is the exact opposite of what we really want to <laughs> achieve. So this combination. So somebody asked the question, what does a sustainability education or pedagogy look like? I think it is the relational, seeing the connections. It is the critical, asking difficult questions, becoming uncomfortable even, uncomfortable together about uh, these inconsistencies in our everyday lives. And the fact that, you know, like uh, they're just politicizing. Why do we still subsidize kerosene? Uh, um, why is there a lot of subsidy for industrial agriculture within the European uh, common? Uh, so these are difficult questions. Why do we have uh, the way, why do we treat animals the way we do in, 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 in bio industry? Uh, 
Um, th these are th so that's that's the critical kind of interrogation of our everyday ways of being and 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 problematizing the normal and 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 making the common less common is uh, the transgressiveness. I would call it in academic terms is also important. And then, of course, the ethical, which I've already mentioned, and the transformative, the actually learning to make change. Uh, there's some great examples of repair cafes where we extend lifetimes, life cycles, and uh, where, where young people repair old vacuum cleaners, where they repair old furniture, and where they actually uh, have a little entrepreneurial enterprise in the school where they actually sell these uh, things to to people who, who who want to support their work, but also who need an, a vacuum cleaner very cheap. And that money is then used for in a kind of a micro economy to purchase solar panels where they have a discussion about what kind of panels do we need then? Uh, which panels are the most sustainable? Uh, are they made in a fair way? Uh, and this is also, I think, important that we do not uh, uh, reduce the sustainability puzzle to the climate crisis. It is a bigger crisis. It is actually, it's a crisis of, of, of uh, my, uh, the way we think. It's a crisis of values. It's a crisis of uh, what does it mean to be human? And I think this is often neglected. We talk about Gert Pista, a Dutch pedagogue, talks about three important uh, purposes of education qualification which has to do with skills and qualities that we need to develop to do to function well in our lives and our work then socialization the the social the, the social cultural norms and, and and ways of being that we want to hand over that we find important uh, and then subjectification which is about creating space for people to reflect on who they are who they are to be, who they are becoming whether they can become who they want to be in the world, what keeps them from becoming who they are, are they being nudged into becoming something they don't want to be, how do these processes work, and these, these are again have to do with social emotional aspects that we often neglect in education, so when we talk about a pedagogy for sustainability, those are critical questions we need to be addressing. Um, following up on that um, kind of Biesta's model, um, it's kind of the purpose of education, I kind of wanted to bring James, you into this thinking about kind of the future of skills, knowledge and work, um, you know, what, what education might be preparing young people for. Um, and um, I guess, you know, again, with that future lens, well, you know, what, what, are the, what are the future green jobs or green skills that, that we need to be thinking about through the education system? So um, James, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, it's, it's an important point. And in a sense, I suppose the, the usual way of addressing this issue is to talk about the ways in which the nature of work are changing radically and rapidly um, with increased digitalization, AI, automation, um, and how that intersects with climate constrained environments, the nature of work changing within those sorts of concept contexts. Um, and the, the more broad ways in which green jobs need to um, permeate our economy and the kinds of skills that are needed. But I don't want to do any of that. I don't want to talk to that particularly. I want to flip the question around a little bit um, and be a bit naughty if that's OK. Um, I think yeah, clearly appropriate and adaptable education and training <clears throat> is critical for ensuring young children, uh, young people and children, have relevant knowledge and skills to engage with the climate crisis and become responsible, climate-informed and climate-active citizens. And Amanda and Steve did really well, and I, I thought they highlighted this really nicely in their emphasis on critical citizenship. I think there's a danger in this, or partly a danger, of reinforcing neoliberal discourses here and emphasising responsabilization on individuals um, and individual young people particularly reinforcing the message that the climate crisis is rooted or the solution to the climate crisis is rooted in small scale individualized activity where it's not you know we know it's not it's it, it's it's about systemic change it's about structural change it's about economic change um, and it's addressing the the kind of inherent structural violence that companies and firms are doing to our ecosystem and so I think you know, actually 
taking a step back and, and, and looking at things at, the, at a system level in terms of skills is, is a more appropriate response. And so a major strand of my work is trying to look at things at this systems level and examine how education and training systems intersect with the economy and this changing nature of work. But for me, this intersection is a key mechanism for the, the long-term structural and social change that's needed to fundamentally disrupt the currently destructive ways which you know the, our economies and labor markets are operating. I think this comes down to the, the point that I made about the, the hidden curriculum of unsustainability and how these sort of neoliberal assumptions are embedded within it uh, and we end up reproducing a sort of cycle of um, constant growth or an assumption that constant growth is the only way forward rooted in this sort of individualistic um, idea of the self. And so I think one way of thinking about this and thinking about this disruption is about problematizing the relationship between skill supply and demand. Uh, education training systems are usually positioned as responding to employer skills requirements, right? Um, so supplying labor markets with young people with the skills that meet employers' demands. And this is, is largely a one-way linear relationship so in, in terms of the climate crisis, this can be seen as companies developing green jobs, usually under pressure or you know, under increasing pressure from the state, from governments, maybe from society. And education and training systems responding by helping students develop green skills. Uh, and of course, you know, this is important, but if we're thinking about disrupting this, I think we can, we can actually challenge this linear understanding of skills, supply and demand and adopt a more cyclical framework for thinking critically about education and training in ways that can actually shape labour markets and economies, making them greener and more sustainable rather than simply responding to them. Uh, and for me, this, this, this work, you know, this looks at helping how students can envision green futures and green careers. Uh, and by doing that, I think young people can be empowered to be agents of economic change. Uh, by developing green skills for themselves, being, being agentic in their skills formation process and envisioning uh, sustainable careers and forcing employers to then respond to their demands for greener careers, greener, greener futures as the next generation of workers. Now, I, you know, this sounds quite utopian in a sense. It sounds, you know, I don't know, sort of rooted in Marx's principles in a way, but I don't think it is. I think there's a genuine possibility here for change, for rooting economic change in students' agencies. Now, recently I did a, um, an HRC funded project um, where I worked with the CEOs and chairs of um, about a third of the FTSE 100. Um, I, you know, I interviewed all of these, uh, these business leaders and one of the, the, the major messages that was coming across was a shift that they were describing from sh um, shareholder capitalism, where the emphasis and purpose of business and, and the labor market is on maximizing profits to, to stakeholder capitalism, where the needs of the wider stakeholders, and increasingly that includes society, are driving the ways in which firms work. So you know, change is possible. And one of the things in which these participants were really emphasizing was that a new generation of employers, sorry, of employees were demanding businesses change to be more values led and values driven. And so they were then having to respond to these values and taking, take a stance on key issues like climate change, like um, you know, a whole range of issues. And so I think by empowering young people to actually put themselves in positions to change the labor market or to, to demand change of the labor market, we can, we can start to get some kind of structural change within the economy. But how do we do that? I mean, we, you talked about sort of practical aspects of this um and rooting this in uh, in in reality in some kind of tangible sense of, of of doing something for me um i think helping young people to do this kind of envisioning of, of 
future careers of, of, of futures and future skills is rooted in uh, storytelling skills. Um, these help young people to think creatively about different futures. Uh, and so some colleagues and I have developed what we've called a, a narrative skills framework for the kinds of skills that help people deal with different kinds of futures and think through different kinds of futures. Uh, we've published that in a, um, a report called Storycraft, where you can unpack some of those skills. But these skills, they're not, they're not sort of generic transferable skills that, that help people think about futures. I think they're rooted in subject knowledge. They're rooted in different forms of knowledge. This is where the issue of um, I think the humanities comes in. A lot, of, a lot of the skills associated with storytelling, narrative craft, are rooted in the humanities, but they go broader than that because what we're talking about are complex futures that draw on knowledge and knowledge of bodies from you know, a whole range of disciplines. And so this is where the importance of actually interdisciplinary work comes in. I think that that aspect of narrative, narrative skills and interdisciplinary work is crucial in actually thinking about the future of work and the future of skills and driving some kind of systemic and structural change within the economy and the labour market. Great, thanks for that. I mean, that's kind of nice, bring us full circle back to kind of some of our starting ideas in terms of the humanities and how we approach this. Um, I've got just one more question before we start going through the Q&A and, and bringing in um, some, some of the, the audience questions. Um, but some of this talk, like there's kind of a talk about kind of story and values and, and I think the emotional angle of engaging with climate change and, and for young people as learners to be facing this ex existential crisis and and so much kind of uncertainty about their future instability kind of traditional systems and careers kind of falling apart so I, it's just a, a question i'm just going to pose this to you kim actually since you've been directly engaging with lots of of young people um climate strikers students in, in your different programs um how does that come up in terms of of the skills young people need to be emotionally resilient in the in the face of climate change and kind of uh, and navigate this uncertain future gosh whenever i think about this um question I, I really relate it back to my business career um and thinking about how poor adults are at bringing their emotions into their into real life and how they're you know all our emotions are squished out of us you know i was in the fortunate position of being able to run a business as as a single mum uh with a with a young child and had to take all my emotions and, and trials and tribulations to work. And as a result, had to allow all my employees to do so. And as a result of that, we ended up with an, an organization where everybody was allowed to bring everything to work and it worked really well. We had a very strong team. And from that, I started sort of following other business leaders who were embracing that um, kind of just being nice to your employees vibe. Um, and it, you know, it just strikes you how little of that there is around still. And that's, that's what I can see. This is the same in schools and that we're not allowing children to bring their emotions to school. We control behaviour rather than looking at the underlying causes of that behaviour. And there is some fantastic um, work being done about, particularly in primary schools, about helping them identify what their emotions are, to name their emotions and allow them to bring that to the, bring those to the party. And I feel that that's something that needs to be carried through the whole school system to the, to the older kids too. Um, I mean, again, I think with the sort of taking kids outdoors, it changes the vibe between the teachers and the students and allows a bit, people to be a bit more human to, and to get out of the constraints of the functionality that you have in school. There's these sort of constraint, constrained conversations and relationships you have in school because everybody's trying to keep their distance from everybody else. So I really think we have to we have to we have to set the example um and allow the kids to bring their own emotions there and help them help them manage that and not see that as a scary or bad thing um great so uh, there's lots of questions in the q a i see that um some of the panelists have been responding directly kind of answering answering in the chat um there's some other resources being shared so lots of information there worth kind of scanning through that um 
One thing that jumped out at me, and it's in part related to something we wanted to dig a bit deeper into anyway, was a, a question about kind of an international perspective on this. What what countries are doing well with, with this kind of thing? Um, different forms of climate sustainability education, which countries are lagging behind. That's come up a little bit in terms of uh, Rahul and Steve talking about the collaboration they're working on, but I... Um, I guess you know it's it's a, it's another thing to reflect on, especially you know Aryan, your work through UNESCO and kind of being part of these networks of environmental and sustainability educators, edu um, leaders of education, and, and then Raul also the research you mentioned, working with educators in, in many different countries. Um, are there are there particular places we should look to, um, or, or is is maybe is the country the wrong scale to be thinking about? Are there are there particular cities that do this well? School districts, schools, um, but and any any reactions on that kind of in international models? So I don't think any one country jumps out. Maybe some of the Scandinavian countries have a lot more flexibility in the curriculum, and I think uh, you know wherever that is afforded to teachers, I think there is of course a big channel to make change, right? But again, that is individual dependent. And a lot of this is based on, you know, currently at least when we've run these workshops with hundreds of teachers in different countries, the interest is always individual driven currently. And I think in order to address this at a wider scale, we are trying to say it needs to get into the system. There are multiple systems we can get into we are advocating for the formal education system. I'm not saying it's the best way, it's the way I we are currently doing it. And of course, there is a, a wonderful amount of work which is happening maybe in the informal education system as well, right? So, uh, you know, certain countries are far more receptive, I would feel, in wanting to introduce it into the curriculum. Uh, you know, we had our national education policy of India, which was released last year. And it does emphasize, you know, adding the environment into a lot more of the curriculum. It doesn't get into specifics of how much and how climate change makes its appearance a bit. But, but you know, the reality is that finally, in order to get this into the system, it has to go through its own process. This tends to be bureaucratic in most parts of the world. And it takes time. But, you know, I wanted to also pick up on something that James said, which I think would be very interesting when we're imagining the future of work. And James mentioned, you know, everyone talks of work as going to change in the future and AI coming in and so on and so forth. But we don't often mention that maybe education will also change in the future. The same tools can be used for effective pedagogy and effective education. So I might be equally utopian and, and silly, in imagining that there might well be a time when we could get, you know, knowledge to places, you know, which are not where you're not constrained by location, right? And 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 I think, you know, in the future, if we are going to depend on the digital, and I know this will bring up questions, uh, you know, you could uh, have access in places where you didn't consider, you know, in, in the past, right? Now. The customization of knowledge, right, is something which is also going to be problematic, but I think that will be at the key or heart of, you know, how people will gain knowledge in the future as well, right? And I think that is something to think about, uh, you know, you know, uh, as, as the future model itself, right, in, in terms of education also evolving over time. And the means of doing it are there right now, so why not embrace that as well? Uh, you know, so so I, I I don't see any one country standing out in terms of saying that we are, you know, it's there in every part of our curriculum. It often makes its appearance as extracurricular work. Sometimes it will make its work in projects or so at the school level. Uh, countries like the U.S. have climate change courses open to all their undergraduates. Uh, you know, some of the private universities in places like India have it. Uh, but, you know, when you look at the large scale government sort of colleges, which follow a, a, a model curriculum, a model syllabus, that tends to sort of, you know, closet climate change into a geography curriculum. And this is outdated and it is outdated in most countries. I don't know how, Stephen, you'd answer this well, how quick it would be to say, 
change the curriculum in the UK for undergraduate. It doesn't happen quickly. On the flip side, you know, as educators and as people who are aware of what is going on, I, in my lifetime, I've never seen kids go on strike to get something in the curriculum. So that's never happened, right? So of course it has to be, you know, put in in a much more meaningful way. But again, you know, there are issues over saying, well, if it is even put in the curriculum, do you currently, and I'm talking at a global level, have enough teachers to actually impart that knowledge, right? So it's, a, it's, it's something we have to think about starting right now. Uh, and I think we have the tools, things are out there for free, which can be totally packaged and used by many, many. Yeah. Just let me add. Bill, uh, because I need to, I'm going to have to, I'm actually teaching in, in just half an hour. So I'm just going to be my last contribution to the panel. Uh, very interesting conversation. A lot, uh, a lot has been said. And uh, um, yeah, just to, to, to uh, echo Raul in, in, in many ways, uh, I think uh, it, 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 it is, uh, the key I think is how much space is there for autonomy and self-determination at the local level to address and engage with these kinds of issues that emerge in our everyday lives and that school, schools need to become yeah responsive. They need to be relevant to today's challenges. They need to be responsive and they need to be in a way responsible by also addressing the moral and ethical components. That also has to do with professional development of teachers. To what extent are they able to do that? So how is your support professional development structure developed in a country? And then indeed in the Nordic countries, you see quite good professional development, quite a lot of space for localized curricula. And they're not pushing a climate change education or human rights education or development education or consumer education or global citizenship education or soil education or water education. We must be careful that it doesn't become a competition between what, what is the best or most important global challenge. That's missing the point entirely. And we fall in the trap of who's best or what's ranked first and second, you know, and it is a systemic global dysfunction issue that we are dealing with here that's much deeper. So it has to do again the purpose of education question, where is that question still being addressed and often it's not even asked that question and that's a very important starting point. Um, so I, I do think that there is more resistance, resistance in society against this culture of accountability, management and control, focusing on the PISA rankings. And, and, and you know, we see universities that do not want to be ranked anymore. We see uh, parents and, and teachers and, and school administrators who, who are really fed up with having to do these kind of performative tasks that are being uh, you know checked by by inspectors and then they uh, their their whole re performance reviews of teachers it depends on on the test scores of students etc cetera, etc cetera. there's resistance because a lot of uh, young people are suffering from that uh, there's you know in some countries where it's really pushed hard there's high suicide rates among long, young people uh, in parts of southeast asia for instance this is going to change this is going to to lead to some change in our schools that will open up more space for these types of topics that we're talking about here today. There's one thing where I kind of, uh, I'm a little bit anxious. Uh, Raul, you said you, uh, twice you said something quite positive about the US in terms of an engagement in climate change education. I think the US has the worst and the best of everything. <laughs> so it also has another side. You know, there are states like Oklahoma where you cannot talk about climate change in the classroom. It's a non-issue. Um, and that is another extreme that we also, <laughs> that is quite worrisome. And Bill probably knows more about that. Um, so with that, uh, um, uh, th thank you, uh, Bill, and thank you, other fellow panelists. And uh, I hope that there will be some more audience interaction coming in. But uh, I, I need to sign off now. Great. Thank you, Arjen. Um Amanda, I was wondering if you wanted to follow up on that um, in terms of kind of how education engages with issues like politics and, and power. Um, is that is that something to dig a little bit more deeply into? 
It's obviously a really tricky one. Um, I, I'm thinking of the sort of the quotation we're probably all very familiar with from Audre Lorde's work about the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Um, and how how you, I mean, the UK government, for example, in the slot, which is normally used for teaching climate change, recently attempted to say you couldn't criticise capitalism. Now, how you talk about climate change without criticising capitalism is, is sort of difficult to imagine. And if it were actually being policed, and I have to say it was probably more likely to be some kind of warning shot. Um, but I mean, I think that there are more, more indirect ways of doing it that I, I, I think should equip students with the skills to, to be um, critical both of the curriculum, but also of the, of the, I mean, I think one of the things is going to be absolutely essential. I, I mean, one can imagine all sorts of dystopian futures from, from this point forwards and, and certainly having a population that's very vulnerable to different kinds of propaganda or to divisive rhetoric um, or to misinformation about what's going on. All these things, I think, are going to be as, as, as dangerous as any other possible threat that comes with climate change. And I think that's one of the things that, that it's crucial to equip students with. And I mean, a lot of that is done I mean, in my experience, it's sort of hard to put it in the curriculum. Um, it's it's more a sort of it's a it's a kind of critical stance. It's a set of skills that come conversationally. And I I, I suppose just to give a very concrete example um, from my own teaching, I've been slowly trying to teach students to think differently about power, partly by rooting it in environments and ecologies and, and what's possible and what the consequences are of acting enacting power in certain ways but also the the role of um different systems of power in in inculcating and developing education and value systems and i mean right back to the earliest states how do you how do you create a situation where the vast majority of the population is producing food for a small number of people who live in the cities who have high culture um how do you create that kind of compliance and what are the long-term effects of creating a population where you just can't um you can't engage your critique um systems of power if you're most people and if you are the people in power you also don't want to because you're invested in it and i mean this is not just sort of ancient history or that you could teach it by means of ancient history then you only need to ask the students whether the world has changed as much as all that and then they can do the rest of it for themselves if you if you encourage them to do that um, so I'm not particularly meaning to destabilize the government kind of <laughs> in secret ways, but I do think that, that there, there are all sorts of, if, if, if it's not possible or, or, or um, problematic to, to be too direct in, your, in, in building this critical thinking, there's a whole host of ways within the curriculum that, 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 that I think can be employed. And I mean, I think it's been used for a very long time. The Holocaust has for a very, very long time been the way of teaching the consequences of, of divisiveness in society. Um, so this isn't a new suggestion. I mean, very little needs to be a new suggestion in some ways. Um, so I, I think that the sort of creative thinking about understanding power and politics and the kind of key terms like development is development, uh, is that a criteria against which we should be measuring either individuals or societies? And if we are, then what are we asking of them and what are the people who don't count as efficient, you know, sufficiently developed? Um, so I think that um, one of the really key elements to uh, dealing with climate change is, is, is teaching teaching people to, to understand a bit better what's going on and, and not to just accept things that they're taught. Great. We, we've we got, I think, seven minutes left. And so I, I don't know, I wanted to leave it open to the panelists. I know you've been scanning the Q&As as well. So was there anything that you saw in the Q&A that you wanted to bring to the whole group? Um, or we could just go around for kind of concluding remarks from each of you. Um, but it, was there anything in the in the Q&A that anyone wanted to, to raise with the group? Yes, I've seen uh, there's a various kind of comments about kind of interdisciplinarity um, that I think are really important. And one um, comment, I can't see it now, um, but was asking um, a question about the way in which um, kind of other systems beyond, I mean, let's talk about a geography context, but these other systems kind of vital to be able to understand um, climate change. And so I, I guess I just want to kind of just really quickly kind of massively agree with that and say that um, absolutely that kind of interdisciplinarity that lots of different people have spoken about from different directions um, and the ways uh, Kim was doing really powerful about the ways in which students kind of really like looking for these links and then really kind of um, like being powered by being able to see these links. Um, that absolutely that kind of that question of um, kind of who's producing this knowledge and what kind 
kinds of expertise might we be able to draw on? Um, and I think there's some like kind of really unresolved big tensions that get raised through that as well. Like James talking about narrative skills, not just being kind of generic, but drawing um, really strongly on these kind of um, subject specific questions um but from the kind of geographical perspective then kind of what counts as geography is obviously this massive vexed question and kind of draws really widely on lots of different things and um, and so absolutely trying to kind of engage with like multiple um plural types of knowledges and um, seems to be so important particularly because uh, this whole question of um the solutions the way that kim's phrase this at the end that they the real problem that solutions to climate change are political and we can't discuss political issues but that question of kind of what does this mean and these different solutions that you can see being prioritized as just neutral that of course we need to do certain forms of kind of carbon capture of course we need to do certain forms of sequestration whatever um that get presented as kind of scientific and neutral um, responses. How can we kind of engage with these big narratives that are being told about these solutions? What problems and how has the whole thing been kind of conceptualized? And so, um, yeah, absolutely, it's kind of um, say that this kind of interdisciplinarity is is vital. And how can we kind of really critically engage with these um, like necessarily and unavoidably political questions? And so my kind of like big last response is just the importance of teachers and just to say that this kind of question that Rahul posed me earlier about um, the curriculum, how long will it take to change the curriculum, like drawing on Stenhouse's broad definition between the curriculum as intended and the curriculum as re reality, that the teacher's real role in kind of creating the reality of that um, means that whatever the, the curriculum is, actually, um, you could change that tomorrow by um, framing it in a slightly different way or asking a different question about it. And so kind of empowering and equipping teachers seems to be kind of absolutely central to lots of this. Um, that's great. And I think, yeah, it'd be great to go around kind of some closing words from everyone. And in the context, you know, COP26 starting this week, you know, action for climate empowerment being the lens through which education and public engagement um, is written into the Paris Agreement, written into the, the UN Agreement on Climate Change. Um, any kind of concluding thoughts based on what we've been talking about? So Raul, can we start with you, actually? Any final, final words? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Thank you to everyone here. Learned a lot. It's been a fantastic discussion. Uh, just to conclude, I think you know what we've not really discussed too much or so is uh, access to knowledge, which would actually be a critical thing when we're talking about a global issue. And uh, you know, I think uh, those are sort of you know discussions which are happening for understanding the impacts of climate change and how it's affecting people at that level. But I think education and providing access to quality education material becomes one very sort of important tool. I hope in the future there's a lot more collaboration, a lot more open source material uh, sharing. And I hope uh, whatever forms get us there, we would use as educators, uh, including tech or so. So I'll kind of keep it at that. I'm um, great. Um, James, any any final thoughts from you? Yeah, th thanks. I've, I've really enjoyed this discussion. Um, it's been really interesting. And, and I think a final thought is, is, is building off Steve's point that teachers sit at the heart of this system. Um, and we need to you know, acknowledge that and empower them to, um, to, to, to be involved in it. But at, at risk of um, sounding controversial, uh, building on, on my previous points about the future of work and um, the world of skills development. I think teachers don't talk enough about work. They don't talk enough about jobs. Um, there's often too much of a focus on the intrinsic value of education. And I think that's really important. Um, but we must also acknowledge you know, what Beaster calls his, 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 his qualifications, the credentialism of education as well, and the ways in which education and training can and does prepare young people for the workplace. And so actually helping teachers to talk about work in a, in a more open way, but also a way that is capable of helping young people ask questions of power is I think absolutely critical. Great, um, Kim, any final, final thoughts? Sure, yes. I mean, picking up on what uh, James is saying about the careers, I, I've for a while thought this is this is a really powerful approach uh, 
both are addressing students' drive for learning and their own sort of seeking out the connections between subjects um, and addressing their anxiety about what's happening with climate and biodiversity loss and things. I think the sort of green career is the kind of the idea that you could have a fantastic career working to solve some of these, these things is, is very enticing. Um, I think great careers advisors in schools and in universities have got a huge role to play here if we can empower them. And green entrepreneurs and business people can bring excitement and inspiration into schools, creating sort of demand amongst the students uh, for, for more knowledge, relevant knowledge, critical skills thinking. Um, and we need to show them that it isn't just, you know, being in a you know climate consultancy or whatever it is. It's like whether you're going to be a plumber, an engineer, a designer, a lawyer, an artist, whatever you're going to be, you've got a massive role to play. And in fact, whatever job you're going to do in the future, it's going to be affected by climate change. So having that knowledge now is really going to set you, put you in a really good position to get the jobs that you want and the careers that you want to take forward. Great. And Amanda, I'll leave it to you to close us out for the session. Sure. Well, I mean, I think that uh, most of what I would have said is a sort of grand closing remark has just been been said by by others. And I'm really I really enjoyed this panel and I found it incredibly um, helpful to hear so much expert thinking um, on these really crucial issues. And I suppose that the, the I mean, what's lots of people are trying to do in lots of different places. And sometimes it's frustrating to feel as if the wheel's being reinvented all over the place. Um, but on the other hand, it's also inspiring to see so many people in so many you know, different regions, as well as different parts of the education system and, and beyond um, thinking about all, all these different issues. Um, I mean, I suppose the the what's really needed is to, is to, to make this a, a, a potent um, way that education policymakers and those who who design and settle the curricula and politicians who have some sway over this um, to, to, I suppose to sort of create a conceptual package that does place climate the climate or well, climate crisis in its broadest possible sense you know, along with a biodiversity collapse and all the the you know the many many consequences and, and complicated ongoing sort of feedback loops if we if we see these as the planetary conditions in which humans are living and then we design our education system with all that in mind um, for, and, and seeing it as a process right through, you know, as James says, into the into the world of work and into the world of people's adult lives. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's, there is already a huge sort of mental health crisis in, our, in, in societies around the world and it's only going to get worse if it's not tackled directly. So empowering future generations and hopefully sort of through them, parents and other adults with new ways of, and, and ways that build out of all this, you know, older, older ways of thinking as well. Um, to, 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 I, I guess to try and create a, um, a kind of feeding in and out of education that really makes sense for, for now and, and the coming decades, I think that it would be, that would be what I'd like to see. Um, so thank you, thank you very much um, to Bill for chairing and thank you to everyone for coming along and I really, um, I'm really glad that we've had this conversation, I hope that we can keep going with it. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Putting us all together and yeah, starting this conversation or continuing this conversation.